Uh, thanks very much. We have an hour and so much to get through, so I am going to, in typical American style, dispense with the elaborate uh, uh, introductions, but let me just quickly go through and, and uh, indicate to you who's on the panel, and of course, uh, many folks here are well known uh, to you. So Bharat uh, Kukani, who now manages uh, stalwart management, was also very um, engaged in many years in the uh, Indian Commodities Exchange, and then was one of the kind of the founding starter-uppers uh, uh, of the uh, Ethiopian Commodities Exchange. Eleni Zaud Gabre Madin, yeah, <laughs> was the founder and the CEO of the Ethiopian Commodities Exchange, which we will now refer to as ECX. Um, going down the line, Andrew Achira, who's now the acting uh, CEO of the Nairobi Stock Exchange. Uh, Donna Astu Astusi? Westeza. Westeza, close, right? Uh, Westeza <laughs> uh, is director after you know, many years in the private sector at, uh, at Citibank, uh, is now director of capital markets at, at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange uh, from now on the JSE. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not least, and uh, this is the guy that you know, everybody uh, needs to pay attention to in this room, Robert Matu, who's the uh, CEO of the uh, Rwandan Capital Markets Authority. So a man uh, uh, whose good side you want to stay on surely. So uh, my uh, moderating style is a little bit uh, akin to that of an Italian family dinner, you know, so everybody can kind of just d d chime in when you think you have something relevant to say about a particular point. Um, we will, I would like to have the opportunity to get back to you a number of different times, so no, we will, we'll try to avoid kind of long, long uh, presentations. Uh, and when I do this, that means please please do wrap up. It's not the peace sign, it's the two minute sign. Yeah. So the arc that I would love to pursue for this panel, which I think would be quite interesting for the audience, and let me just kind of tell you how I, I would like it to evolve if I could, is to, to let us know, you know, how did you get, how did these exchanges kind of get where they are right now? What were some of the key decisions? What were some of the key sequ sequencing decisions, some mistakes, that, that, that sort of thing? Then I'd like to talk about the structure, some of the structural uh, questions that you have to decide when you are thinking about setting up uh, exchanges of various types. Uh, third, generating demand and generating awareness for the exchanges and uh, making it actually part of the, of the, you know, both on the issuer side and of course on the investor side. Then I want to talk a bit about regulation, some of the key regulatory uh, questions. Uh, then I want to, of course, uh, talk about kind of um, some regionalization opportunities, as uh, will come as no surprise to you. And then a little bit about, uh, to talk about kind of going forward, how we think uh, the, the, the exchanges will evolve, the environment in Africa largely for, for public markets will evolve. And then I will try to throw in there, you know, along the way some um, uncomfortable questions just to kind of keep it uh, real. So, uh, Eleni, why don't we start with you? You, uh, you have uh, founded this, uh, the Commodities Exchange, and uh, previous, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but previous to this, kind of the commodities exchanges were, were futures markets, uh, mostly. I mean, you, your main innovation was that you kind of integrated a spot market exchange and a future market exchange into one, uh, one exchange or, or a notion. Can you just talk us through a little bit the thinking of that, uh, how you evolved that, and some of the key decisions that you made, and some of the questions you were asking yourself along the way, and Bharat, you know, please jump in as well when you... Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stacey. Um, you know, the idea of, of why we want an exchange, I think, is, is where we should start, and, and it was, um, you know, alluded to yesterday in Ethiopia's comments in the very, very beginning, which is that what we want an exchange for, and whatever it is that we trade, is to be able to really reflect the true underlying fundamentals uh, in the market. What uh, supply and demand, you know, economics 101, uh, when they meet, what is the right price and how do we trust that that's the right price? How do we have credible uh, market mechanism that really reliably um, brings the buyers and the sellers together? So that's a problem that I had been uh, grappling with from my research uh, background uh, going around Africa doing survey after survey in many different countries all over Africa about why the markets weren't working uh, for everyday people. Uh, and they, would, you know, people will tell you, well, I don't know what I'm getting, so I have to, you know, change the sacks each time and, and look inside to see if it's full of stone or if it's really maize. Um, when I want to get paid, I have to go chase after uh, the person that owes me money. And in fact, my brother in my little stall is only does that. You know, he ha he has to go find the payment, and it sometimes takes three weeks, four weeks. And 
uh, later on in my career when I was at the World Bank, um, I went to Ethiopia uh, on a mission and, and heard about these scandals of people committing suicide uh, because they hadn't gotten paid, farmers had not gotten paid, had to repay their own fertilizer loans or you know, school fees for their children. And because they were under this incredible distress, uh, there were actually cases of suicide in, in the paper. So clearly the problem existed that we needed to figure out how to reliably bring buyers and sellers. Uh, so that's really the, the idea behind creating an exchange uh, around the idea that we're not trading the commodity itself, we're trading contracts. Mm -hmm. And contracts are standardized ways uh, to, 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 you know, to, to set up the, the trading or the transaction. Uh, and I remember actually being in India around the time I met Bharat uh, in 2006, uh, sitting at MCX, multi-commodities exchange, and sort of um, um, uh, a light went off, uh, which was that you know they were we were talking about how does the futures uh, contract work, how, you know what's the margining, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I remember looking across uh, at the at the uh, the team that we were uh, discussing with, and I said, why can't we do this for a spot? market? Why can't we do this in the physical? Because everything you're talking about, mm -hmm. standards, where should it be delivered, uh, settlement terms, uh, quotation terms, all of these are things that if we could standardize in the spot market, then we would actually really solve this problem that I've been dealing with for the you know, past 10 years of my, of my career. And I remember people said, no, 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 that's not, you know, that's the off exchange, that's, a, that, that's not done. I said, but I don't see why we cannot build. And we, we ended up having a huge debate. Um, you know, I don't see why we can't take a futures contract mm -hmm. and modify it to make it a 100% uh, upfront margin mm -hmm. instead of you know, uh, a partial margin, and why we can't do, similarly modify uh, the settlement, uh, again, to make it uh, an immediate uh, delivery and immediate settlement, and yet retain all the other things that we want in the futures contract. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's really the experiment that we embarked on. Uh -huh. uh, and I have to say that um, I felt that uh, and in Ethiopia we, we took the position that if we didn't do it that way, then we would end up with a lack of convergence. Uh, and when I brought Bharat onto the team, this was something that we used to do extensive training about, is that if we, when we build a futures um, market, uh, we would want that market to be closely aligned to the underlying physical market. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't have a reliable physical market, then we couldn't really build a futures market down the road. So, so this really kind of was the second yeah. uh, thinking, is that even if we leapfrogged into building simply a, a price risk management mechanism, uh, as in a futures uh, uh, market, it would actually be completely separate, uh, a separate uh, mechanism or, or platform than, than the underlying fundamental, so that we want it to be gradual, build up from the ground, and that was kind of the, the, the justification. That, yeah, that is super interesting. And Bharat, let me ask you a follow-up question on that, because you gave me a very nice uh, way of thinking about this, the fundamental issue that Delaney brought up about the, you know, needing the spot marking and needing the, well, let, let, me, let, let me let you tell your, your light, uh, your light to, to make sure that you get this right before you can have a functioning uh, uh, futures market. So can you share that with us? Yeah. Uh, I think for a functioning futures market, there are certain enabling environments that need to exist, infrastructural, uh, say, structures that need to exist. I always give this analogy, like, uh, I have a room which is dark, I need to illuminate it with a light. I have brought a very good, uh, say, uh, light that would illuminate this room. Now, the moment I plug it in into the, uh, say, power supply, boom, it goes off. Why? Because the, it's not the light was not uh, good. It was not the quality of the light that was not good. It was not the system that was not good. It was the power supply that was not working. And that's what the spot exchange is. So the power to the, uh, say, futures exchange actually is derived out of the spot exchange or spot market. And especially in India, uh, say, when the MCX came up, MCX realized that the organized spot structures are not there. The spot market structures are not there. So it had to work a lot on organizing the spot structures, physical deliveries, physical uh, mechanism of handling the, uh, say, structures. All these things were very important. And if you look at that, that's what a spot exchange would do. So setting up a spot exchange is nothing but harmonizing the, uh, say, play of the, the structures, the making it, uh, say, suitable for a futures exchange, making the platform for the futures exchange. So what I believe is uh, for a spot exchange, the role of a spot exchange is to provide a launch pad for the futures exchange. And futures exchange in turn, you cannot have a futures exchange unless and until you've built up a spot part of it. Now, not necessarily a spot exchange per se. It has to be a structured spot trading mechanism okay. that would actually feed into the information uh, to the futures. And, and tell us what that is. What does that mean, a stu structured spot trading mechanism? 
the major thing is, uh, say, there has to be, uh, say, the few, the, there are a few critical ingredients. Infrastructural, uh, say, uh, say or, uh, like the institutional infrastructure, you can call it. You have to have a physical handling mechanism. You have to have spot and futures actually converging to, its, uh, to each other at the uh, close of delivery. That's where uh, it, it, the, the physical handling mechanisms become important. So MCX, when it came up with the futures exchange, it realized it requires a physical handling department, which no exchange in the world by then was doing. Uh -huh. So a, de a, 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 a logistics uh, component, a collateral management component was built into uh, that, but to support the physical, uh, say, uh, say, exchange, or the physical uh, say movement of the stock. You need to organize the uh, small holders into a structure. Organizing small holders into a structure, of course, uh, the membership structures uh, work very well, but below the membership structure, the clan structures, that is where the organization of the small holders happen. So that has to be, uh, say, brought in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Grading and standards. As Eileen rightly said, what we what a futures exchange or an exchange would do is trade in contracts. Enforcement of the contract and uh, say enforcement of the grades and standards is something that you need to uh, bring in. Mm. If these components of the physical, I'm, I'm talking about commodities. Yeah, if no, these these components of the physical are not part of the uh, say structure, a futures exchange would really not be uh, that successful. And I remember after uh, the futures ex after the uh, futures exchange was launched in India and the spot was really uh, not that strong. In 2008, the government had to go back, appoint a senior economist in India and, uh, who did a re detailed research and came out with the conclusion that you need to strengthen the spot. The problem is not in the futures market. The question was, is futures market uh, leading to inflation? Futures market, uh, are, are the f favorite whipping boy uh, when it comes to the inflationary trends. But the, the, the thing was, you actually put a cart before right. the horse. Yep. And I, so you, I want to talk about that later, so yeah. maybe I'll, I'll, yeah. we'll so I'll stop that there. Yeah, no, 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 but, but, that's, but I think that's fundamental to just lay out the key things that you cannot get wrong. And, you know, and, and Donna, if I can kind of turn to you, because you are the grand dame of, of exchanges on the, uh, in Africa. And I know you were not there at the inception, of course, but if you kind of think about the, um, the, the evolution of, of the JSE, what were, you know, what, what kinds of things were, were grappled with and how did you get where you are and what were some of the kind of the key things, that you, key fundamentals that had to be in place in order to, to have a thriving exchange? Well, the, the history of the JSE is actually very Can you move to it? Can, yeah. yeah. can, can you all hear me? No, you're, I don't think your mic is. Is my mic on? Yeah. Oh, I think go. it is yeah. now. Can hear myself. Anyway, thank you, Stacey. Look, I think the, the first thing that, that I'd like to say is, is on behalf of my colleague, Tamson, who's here with me, is how proud we are to be here at this conference, because notwithstanding the fact that a lot of people might think that the JSE is a very different exchange because of our size and, and the global standing that we have, we are very much an African exchange. And uh, even though today we may be grappling with uh, issues around high frequency trading and low latency and Twin Peaks regulatory frameworks and so forth, our roots are very much in Africa and we are also dealing with some of the same issues that our colleagues are dealing with. And Twin Peaks uh, regulatory framework is, what? It, can you explain? That's basically a segregation of regulatory responsibility between the Financial Services Board, which will be looking after market conduct and the South African Reserve Bank, which will be looking after prudential requirements. Okay. But, but just going back, Stacey, I think the history of the JSE is very, is very interesting. And, it, and just going back to what Eleni was saying, the, the roots of our exchange, and I, th and I think it still is relevant today, is really it lies in the real economy. The exchanges in South Africa grew up in the mining areas. There was more than one exchange back in the 1880s. Uh, they grew up around the mining exploration areas, and the conversion from exploration into production was financed by equity. In fact, when I first moved to South Africa in 1994, I was still quite struck by how much of financing in the economy was done in the equity markets as opposed to through debt. Um, but, but the JSE itself was formed and the, mar and the markets uh, centralized into one exchange in 1887. Uh, and then if you fast forward from 1887 until the 1990s, it was in the late 1990s that the exchange deregulated. Uh, we went away from fixed commissions. At that time, we saw a, a large um, entrance of international broker-dealers into South Africa. A lot of the South African broker-dealers were acquired by global broker-dealers. We converted from open outcry trading to a fully electronic platform. Um, in 1997. In 2001, we acquired the South African Futures Exchange 
commencing our road down the path of uh, multiple asset classes mm -hmm. on the exchange. In 2005, we demutualized and listed on our own exchange. I think that's a very important step because it turned us to be very commercially focused, not just around trading activity, but also around looking for, for additional listings and new products on the exchange. And can you explain uh, demutualized? Demutualized, uh, the, the exchange was owned by the broker dealing community, uh, and we basically changed our ownership structure and listed on our own exchange. I think my, our colleagues from Kenya have done that uh, as well, and I think it's a model that's gaining traction. Uh, certainly our members uh, and our uh, investor community were happy to see that, again, because they felt that having uh, a commercial focus would drive us to uh, seek out new listings, would see to seek out innovative products and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I think the last innovative and, and sort of evolutionary steps we took in 2009, we purchased the Bond Exchange of South Africa, uh, and therefore became a platform for equities, for derivatives, for foreign exchange and currencies, uh, and for commodities. And most recently, in uh, the past couple of years, our CEO, Nikki Newton-King, has embarked on an integration uh, strategy to integrate all these markets, because they were very much organized and managed as separate markets. We've now realized that there's benefits to both issuers and investors if we integrate, and that was part of, of, of the restructuring, which led to my uh, being brought into the exchange. Okay. So I'm going to uh, in, at, come back to you and ask you about that, because you've made it sound very easy and seamless, and I'm sure it, it, it was wasn't. It all done and, before I got there. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll dig in a, li a little bit more to that. But, um, but Andrew... Uh, you know, I, w I was uh, privileged to go to a, a Kenyan Capital Markets Authority offsite, uh, and demutualization was on the table for uh, for the NSC as well. And it it was not I would it's fair to say it was not so popular in the room. I I, I would say with the broker dealers. So can you can you uh, you've been with the exchange I think over a decade, right? Yes. Uh, haven't you? Yes. Um, so can you talk about kind of the modern <coughs> evolution? And you're also one of the most important exchanges in Africa, of course. Some of the uh, you ha you were the only game in town. You had this nice kind of monopoly, and then you also decided to get a bit more kind of commercially aware and serving. And, can you talk to us about some of the decision making and how hard that was, and, and in particular about the demutualization? Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Stacy. Um, maybe just as a background, the exchange is currently 61 years old, formed in 1954. Are you, is he mic'd? Are you mic'd? Okay, so Sorry, in, in 1954, yeah. uh, formed in uh, 1954. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the history, a lot of the companies that were listed then were from the colonial era, and what happened is that. In order to get Kenyans, after we got independent in 1963, there was a government initiative to bring in uh, Kenyan stockbrokers into the market. Uh, but fast forward to that, in 1990, we formed the Capital Markets Authority, which is responsible for, which is responsible for the oversight of the whole market. Uh, but again, at that point, we were still a very small exchange, seven stockbrokers. In uh, 1994, we brought in a few more stockbrokers. Uh, still having the open outcry system, and this continued for a bit of time. But the first change that we did was actually a technology change, which was in 2004 when we uh, automated the settlement side by creating the CDSC as a separate entity. Uh, in 2006, we finally moved away from the open outcry system and uh, established an ATS, went to a wide area network the following year in 2007. But at, the, at this point, as all these things were happening, one of the key issues that happened is that there was a change in government policy in terms of privatizations and bringing okay. government entities to market. Okay. And in 2004, we saw the listing of, uh, 2006, we saw the listing of Kenchen, which brought out about over 200,000 investors into the market from a previous 20,000. And the technological changes that happened around this time is actually what really made us grow. Uh, you can imagine a market that had a market capitalization of about $5 billion uh, dollars in 2002, or 2003 actually, uh, to 10 billion in 2008, to currently about 30 billion dollars in terms of the equity space. Um, so in terms of where we have reached growing six times in the last 12, 10 or 12 years, I think I could say it's because of one, ensuring that the proper policies are there, uh, government support, uh, technological inclusion in how we carry out our processes, uh, but also I think the marketing element and trying to put uh, position the market as the go-to place for investments. Um, at that point, I think we had maybe about 20% uh, 
uh, foreign investment uh, investor participation. That's about 2008, 2009. Uh, right now we are teetering above 50% foreign investor participation. So now the challenge that we have and um, from the conversations yesterday is how to get a larger percentage of our locals and East Africans back yeah. to the market yeah. so that we don't become overly reliant on the foreign uh, investment side. Yeah. So uh, talk, that's... Mm, talk to us about Safaricom in particular yes. and how, what, what happened and then what are the lessons that you learned to your point? Um, at the point when Safaricom came to listing, we had uh, maybe just about 200,000, 300,000 CDS account holders. Safaricom itself was one of the largest issues we had in our country. Uh, looking for an equivalent of about 50 billion shillings at uh, that time. That's equivalent of about $600 uh, million dollars currently. Um, uh, $600 million dollars currently. Um, it was five times oversubscribed. Um, so $3 billion dollars was actually raised uh, for the offer. And uh, from an investor point of view, we had uh, new applicants and new people coming into the stock market uh, totaling to about a million shillings, and this is for a country that has 40 million shillings, 40 million people as, as, as a population. So we had uh, 1 million applicants into the CDA, uh, opening up CDS accounts for Safaricom. So yes, Safaricom was actually a watershed uh, part for our market. Um, it had its ups and downs, at least it, uh, it literally. Was, we, we were able to underst uh, understand that maybe the market was not ready uh, to that extent to carry out, um, had about 17, 18 brokers then. Uh, to be able to carry out an issue of this uh, of the size, but I think the lessons were not very. Uh, they, they they helped us move and grow a bit faster. And uh, one of the things that we did was op uh, open up an integrated broker back office system for all the market participants, just to be able to mitigate the risks and frauds that uh, could arise from uh -huh. such a huge issue. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, Robert, you know, Eleni really, I think, very rightly so. Uh, reminded us that you really need to start with, you know, what is the point of an exchange in an economy, in capital markets, and it's really about price discovery and making sure that uh, there's that kind of understanding about price. And But you as a regulator, you're a regulator, but in addition you are trying to develop markets. And so you've got this kind of natural um, tension, I would say, that in order to have the price discovery, you need some, you need a certain amount of economic size and liquidity and depth to the market, right? But in order to get that kind of liquidity and depth to the market, then you and to, to, you've got to promote that market and you've got to bring in, you know, foreign participation and that sort of thing. And then this can be can create maybe some issues around volatility. And then you've still got to think about protecting the the small um, equity shareholder in, in Rwanda. And so, how do you balance this kind of need to need to develop markets, uh, need to protect uh, investors, and need to kind of um, uh, promote and also regulate uh, uh, the market. Uh, thank you, Stasi. Now, um, sometime I wonder whether I'm a regulator or stock exchange or the stock broker because when you're starting a market, um, there are issues of sequencing how yeah you should uh, implement a stock exchange because that's the ultimate aim of setting up a capital market. Now, I will uh, focus on, on Rwanda for now because I've uh, been in other markets and uh, my colleague um, Andrew has uh, talked about Nairobi. Yes, when you setting up a market, um, the attributes of a market are about the pricing of assets, the type of assets, the players, the regulatory environment. But at the same time, if you set up a shop, you have to make sure that um, it's well stocked. You have to make sure that customers walk in and out and find what is there. So to begin with, what I would like to say is that um, it was mentioned earlier, there has to be a political will, one, secondly, you end up finding yourself relying or riding on the back of the existing um, governance structures within the public sector and uh, the society generally. These are significant fundamentals. Now then when you go to the market, uh, you, need, um, you need basic laws to be in place 
like the Companies Act, there has to be businesses that are registered uh, legally. Um, you also need structures that enable um, securities to be registered somewhere. You need instruments that uh, are used to um, transfer that securities from one party to another. Otherwise, you may ne never um, have a, um, a market for that mm -hmm. matter. So then you also need players around this market. Mm. You know, we are talking about um, you need banks to do the clearing, you need the intermediaries, the brokers to trade, um, you need a custodian. Um, then you need the asset managers who will support the market. Now, with regard to price discovery, because that's the, the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. Any person who walks into a market and buy a financial asset, um, the experience they get shortly after that is what will determine whether they are going to keep their money in that market. And that was my greatest fear. And when you're bringing the first company uh, to the public, you ask yourself, what would happen to these novice investors if they buy this share and it goes down? So without appearing to in, uh, interfere with the pricing, you, what you first of all make sure is that the pricing mechanism uh, mm -hmm. is there okay. and is understood by all players. Yeah. So uh, finally, I will give you an experience of our first IPO. Um, it was, um, the valuation was done, but the ultimate price that came to the market was decided by the issuer. And it was a clear intention that there was need to transfer some value into people who are coming to the market for, for the mm -hmm. first time. Then in the end, um, you try to make sure that the quality of investors who come to buy shares in that market um, should be a concern. So we've been lucky in Rwanda, for instance, to get um, very high uh, quality, um, I would call portfolio investors or asset managers from um, around the globe. So okay. I think I I'll stop there for mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So I wanted to stay with this theme and kind of go down the, the, the line, actually, in terms of how do you have a, a, a high-quality trading environment, by which I mean there's enough liquidity, but it's also kind of well enough regulated so that uh, there's not market manipulation and other kinds of problems and different kinds of exchanges, given the different structure and the, and the asset classes that are on them, f face these challenges in different ways. And so we'll make this a bit more of a kind of a more of a lightning round, but I want to kind of get, the, get a, a view uh, uh, of some of the, the challenges that you've all faced. And, and Bharat, let me start with you and let me ask you to, again, tell the, tell the story in uh, India about what, um, what happens with regulatory fragmentation and some of the issues there and how, how that can affect the trading environment. Okay. I think uh, regulatory environment, like what does a regulator do? Regulator, in my opinion, is a policeman and a promoter, both. He has to play both the roles. He or she. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, sometimes what happens is uh, commodity markets are very, very complex. Complex in the sense there are overlapping areas or overlapping, say, aspects. Uh, in India specifically, commodity exchanges are a part, of a part of commodity exchanges into the financial industry or the financial markets where exchanges are trading into futures and all. There's a spot part of it which is beyond the capacity of the financial regulators. So there are these, these uh, say this leads to a situation where there's a gap in regulation. And this is something which India experienced recently. Uh, what happened was a spot exchange came up. Now spot exchange, when it came up, nobody knew how to regulate it because the Forward Contract Regulation Act that regulates the futures markets, they said, yeah, this is, this is not a spot market. This is a spot market. This is not a futures market, so this is beyond our control. We don't regulate it. The, the spot exchange regulators, which is essentially the state governments, 29 state governments individually regulating it, uh, they said, this is an exchange. We, we don't regulate the exchanges. Exchanges is part of uh, the FMC. So that meant that there was a gray area when Nobody was regulating a spot exchange. And what spot exchange was doing, nobody was uh, looking at. They introduced, a uh, they introduced a transaction, which is a report rate. Which report is rate that, sorry? A what? A, a report, report rate, uh -huh. which is like a spot backed up by a future. So there's a, one leg oh, of the yeah. trade is spot, and the other leg is future. Now, 
they said, the regulator said, this is a spot, this originates with a spot, we are not regulating it because it's not futures contract. But other part was futures. And nobody regulating the spot trade that way. So now it was, a, it was used as an instrument to actually finance the uh, business. How? I buy spot and sell futures. Okay, so I, when I buy spot, I actually pay money to somebody and I uh, say sell futures, so get it back. The difference between that is the interest cost. That's how it was structured. The stock was to be in the warehouses, managed by the exchange, it never moved out. The problem was nobody actually went in and saw that if the stock existed or not. So when this type of thing happened, there were fictitious companies, fictitious traders who came up, were dealing one end in the spot, the other end in the futures. When the futures was deliverable, since physical delivery was not happening, they would go back, sell more spot, and pay out the futures for cash settlement. Mm -hmm. And this kept on building up, and it led to a $16 billion scam, $16 billion siphoned out of the uh, system. It's a Ponzi scheme, it's, really. it's a, It became a Ponzi mm -hmm. scheme. Mm -hmm. So that's where the regulators have to be, and, and that's where commodity markets become very complicated, because uh, who does, how, it, it, there are multiple uh, regulators. Financial market regulators come into picture, the physical market regulators come into picture, the warehouse regulators come into picture, and then uh, it's, 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 uh, it's quite, uh, yeah. uh, say, complicated. Right. So, so, so regulators what's need the to lesson? be, yeah, yeah, what's that's the, a lesson the, uh, that, that, that showed the world or that showed the uh, industry that uh, you really need to be, uh, say, well regulating and then uh, it led to a lot of regulatory changes in India. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, there was a regulatory gap which was exploited. Yeah. Uh, Eleni, yeah. you spoke about the importance of, of price discovery, but at the same time on your market, you, uh, well, I won't say you, but you, you, you're forcing everybody onto this market, right? And, you know, so there's a couple of different models. One is a fully public, nobody can have any, there's no such thing as an over-the-counter uh, trade in commodities in Ethiopia. Other models, uh, Jendai and Tim, uh, raise your hands there, they, they are running a private, fully private commodities market in Rwanda, Malawi, also a private commodity. So how do you get a real price discovery when you're basically forcing everybody to, to use this market? And how do you think about um, the quality of the marketplace in those terms? But you also do better on the liquidity, obviously, by doing that. So how do you think about those, uh, that, yeah. that problem? This is a very important question, and thank you for asking it. Um, it actually goes back a little bit to what uh, Bharat was just saying as well, um, which is that really, you know, in, in my view, um, and I remember Ethiopia's uh, giving a speech about this many years ago in Ethiopia, that regulation evolves also alongside the market itself. And that, that as we build and as markets become increasingly more sophisticated, um, regulations and, and the way that we ensure the, the, the very principle on which we establish the market that we are able to maintain should also evolve alongside. So in, this, in a sense, uh, it's all very dynamic and as you know, uh, even in the most, some of the most sophisticated markets in the world, uh, including uh, of course the US, um, you know, no. we're, we're currently in the same, almost asking the same question that you just asked, which is what should we allow to be exclusively traded on exchanges, mm -hmm. uh, and what should we allow to, you know, to, to trade elsewhere, and reining in some of the things that we think of as traditional, you know, over-the-counter, off-exchange trading is actually being reined back in, because just like Bharat described in India, some of those instruments that the market created got out of, out of control and became uh, actually detrimental mm. to the market outcome. So in a nascent uh, market, as in Ethiopia, if we're trying to build uh, a price discovery mechanism where we're trying to create a critical mass into a single marketplace, uh, you know, we had the choice of whether we're going to basically wait uh, for uh, you know, competing marketplaces to sort of converge into a single, single marketplace, or whether to nudge it along, as was said yesterday, via policy. And there were actually different choices of that. One could be an incentive scheme, and I believe some of the uh, stock exchanges on the continent have had tax incentive schemes and still have tax incentive schemes in order to try to push or promote uh, trading uh, into, the, into the stock exchanges. Uh, that was one of the things that we looked at in, in, in Ethiopia. Uh, but the other is to actually try to uh, nudge it uh, in a more direct way, a directive way, which is to say, again, it's not the trading of the commodity, it's the trading of the contract. A contract specifies 
the, the grades, uh, the, the delivery uh, locations, and a lot of other you know, rather rigid parameters of how the trading of a particular uh, uh, commodity would happen. So to then basically, uh, and, and what we did is actually look at how um, early stage markets in some, of the, in some of the economies that we were looking at actually had treated this question. How do you build uh, critical mass? So, um, you know, if you look um, even into the history of, uh, of futures trading uh, in the US, there are actually regulatory um, decisions uh, made to push or in some cases even make it very difficult to trade off exchange, and as I've just said, uh, you know, the Frank Dodd right now is reining in uh, some of the things that were allowed off exchange to, to now have to uh, mm. come back in. So there actually are already precedents mm -hmm. of requiring certain contracts under certain conditions to be traded exclusively on uh, regulated exchanges because what we want at the end of the day is to have markets that are reliable, transparent, uh, you know, tr building trust uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, economy. And even where regulation itself hasn't created this single marketplace, mm -hmm. the economics of trading has done it on its own. And I want to give you the example of trading of wheat on exchanges in the US. Okay. Um, uh, for example, if you want to trade or if you want to know where the hard red spring wheat contract is, it's only on the Minneapolis Grain Exchange, while the hard Red, uh, sp uh, so the hard red spring wheat is on the Minneapolis Grain Exchange and on no other U.S. exchange. The hard red winter wheat contract is exclusively on the Kansas City Board of Trade. And then the soft red winter wheat is traded exclusively in Chicago. So in other words, even markets recognize that there is a value yeah. to creating a single marketplace, even where the regulator may not explicitly force it that way. Yeah. And, and so I think that you know, this is a, a difficult question because people start to say, oh, then this must not be a free market. There must be some you know, heavy hand of, of, of government or intervention. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very easy to, to say that in the case of Ethiopia because of uh, the history of Ethiopia's governance okay. itself. Okay. But I think this is a real market issue. Okay. And, and that has been handled in different ways in different markets. Okay. So that's a model that you, I mean, you obviously yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, and Donna, let me just, because uh, Andrew, we, we gave you a, uh, let, me, let me go to, to to, to Donna first, and just talk about sort of market quality, and had you have, have you had any growing pains at the, at the JSE, and how have you, any lessons learned uh, that you would share about uh, making sure that you have a good trading environment? Mm -hmm. uh, That's a very good question. I think the, um, for those that may not be aware, uh, the JSE is an SRO, a self-regulatory organization. We are um, under the, uh, the rubric of the Financial Services Board that, that does provide oversight. Uh, we've had a Financial Markets Act. The first one was done in 1947. We have a new Financial Markets Act that's under review at the moment and will be implemented soon. Um, but in order to, to, uh, to implement that regulatory framework, uh, on the uh, issuer side, we have an issuer regulation department uh, that looks at the uh, qualifications of uh, issuing companies that propose to list on either our main board or our Altex, which is our junior board for small and medium-sized companies. Uh, and once companies are listed, there are continuing obligations that you have to comply with, and our, our listings group uh, monitors those. There is a Chinese wall between what they do and what we do on the commercial side of the business. Uh -huh. In terms of market surveillance, we do have a market regula regulatory team as well, and they are constantly uh, trolling through all the trading statistics, everything that comes out of our technology platforms to ensure there's been no price manipulation, there hasn't been insider trading, front running, and so forth and so on. So mm -hmm. we do have those uh, those activities in place and very much embedded. And I think a lot of you probably know that the, the JSE for the fifth year in a row was ranked by the World Economic Forum out of 144 countries as having the best regulated securities exchange in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, you know, it's something we're, we take great pride in. We're proud that it's an African exchange that has this accolade. But it does put a lot of pressure on making sure that you stay there, because the worst thing that can happen is to be number one today and not number one tomorrow. Mm. Uh, so how do we ensure that? And a lot of it, Stacy, is looking at market quality indicators. Um, there are a lot of uh, questions now, particularly since we've seen uh, globally a trend towards high-frequency trading, mm -hmm. algorithmic-based trading. Right. Uh, and given uh, the technology investments that we've made, we just opened a low-latency co-location center in May. 
we have seen an increase. Uh, what, uh, what is a low latency co-location? Low latency is where you move your trading platform closer to the exchange so you can trade faster and you see prices faster and you can hit those bids or offers faster. Okay. So the, obviously the question then becomes, what is the impact? And if there are people sitting in the co-location center or, or even without a co-location center, if you've got someone trading from Nairobi and someone trading from Mobasa, is the person in Nairobi, because they're closer to the exchange, getting a better deal mm -hmm. than someone sitting in Mombasa? Right. So these eventually are issues I think all of our colleagues in Africa are going to have to face at one point or another. Um, but what we have done is uh, we've been monitoring market quality. We've been monitoring levels of liquidity. We've been monitoring what's happened with spreads. Um, and we've noticed that uh, liquidity has gone up. We've noticed, and, we, and very interestingly, uh, our value traded last year went up by 2%, notwithstanding the fact that we had an a, a all-time high record value traded on the 18th of December, which was almost 40% was higher than the previous value uh, of 50, almost 54 billion rand, or 5.4 billion US dollars, more or less. Um, but what we have noticed is whereas the value traded went up by 2%, the, num the, the number of trades went up by 16%. So that's telling us that we're getting more trades on the exchange for a lower value. Okay. A lot of that coming from high frequency traders. So what we do is we're looking at order to trade ratios to make sure that people just aren't putting in orders uh, and bluffing the market, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, order to trade ratios have stayed very healthy. We've also looked at spreads to, see, to make sure that spreads aren't widening, that spreads are in fact coming in, and we found that they are coming in. And, and how do you kind of uh, characterize sort of the, les the lesson for, uh, you know, if you, if you could sort of summarize a couple of just the key lessons that you've, you've, you've come Look, from? I think segregation of responsibility is critical. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to have a, a focus on the, the um, requirements and the regulation of the listing, listed companies to make sure that you have quality instruments on your board. If you don't, you won't have liquidity. Yeah. Uh, and to maintain the reputation of the board. And in the trading environment, to make sure that you're monitoring uh, that you do have proper price discovery, that there is no unfair advantage, that the end investor is treated fairly. And there's a lot of controversy about that in the U.S. right now yeah. with a fragmented market and, and paying of, uh, of um, entities to put trades through certain exchanges. Yeah. I think it goes back to people. We were talking yesterday a lot about people. President Kigali spoke about people. Ethiopia spoke about people. And we can talk about people in terms of capital markets being the beneficiaries of what we do, that we raise capital, we build infrastructure projects, and so forth. We can talk about people in terms of the ones that, that uh, benefit from our trading venue, the broker-dealers, the yeah. issuing companies. Yeah. But we operate the markets. Yeah. We are the people. It's up to us to ensure that we have a fair trading platform, that there is proper price discovery, and that we are innovative uh, while being um, prudent regulators to ensure that there's proper um, exploitation of the opportunities that we have in Africa. Okay, great. So let me let me let me, let me stop you there. Um, and and um, Andrew, you you gave you were you gave some indications of how you think about market quality, and I'll I'll let you comment on that if you if you wish. But I'd also like to use you to kind of pivot from regulation to promotion a bit more. Yes. Um, and in particular, there's a couple of different uh, models, and this was a big topic yesterday about SMEs and what do SMEs require on an exchange. And um, there are two models. One is the kind of the more the JSC model where they're on a bit of a separate exchange. And you, uh, on the uh, Nairobi Stock Exchange, they are very much part of the same exchange. How do you... Um, what do you do for SMEs? How do you attract SMEs? How do you think about this, uh, the, the, the services that SMEs require? And, and what, what's the approach uh, there for market development? Um, on that question, I think, I think you first have to appreciate the, the ecosystem any exchange uh, operates in. Uh, from Kenya, where we live, 80% um, of the formal economy is actually in the SME space. And um, as an exchange, we took the view together with the Capital Markets Authority that we need to recognize the fact that the SMEs are actually the predominant way of doing business in Kenya and to be able to facilitate them to come to market. So in terms of, and this is a good example of what Donna alluded to a bit earlier on, uh, uh, regulation and promotion at the same time uh, happening at the same time. So uh, together with the Capital Markets Authority and ourselves, we did uh, 
produce a framework uh, through which SMEs can list. And at that point, uh, remember, um, being a small economy, uh, relatively, uh, to uh, uh, growing uh, uh, emerging markets, what happens is that we looked at it and valued it at $100,000 or thereabouts as minimum market capitalization. There's a lot of new ideas, so in terms of the duration of existence of any company, it's just one year. But say that, I think one of the things that we have not yet fully perfected is the fact that it's easy to list on the gems market, what we call the growth enterprise market segment, but it's not necessarily easy to live inside the gems market because you're not listing just for the sake of listing, you're listing so that you can be able to derive value from it. And there's conversations going on between ourselves and the Capital Markets Authority on how to be able to develop this, what kind of risk mitigation measures to be able to at least balance off uh, the commercial aspect and the regulatory aspect. But in a broader sense for the whole market, what we are trying to do is basically uh, together the CMA and it's very important for any cap uh, capital markets growing to be able to have a fantastic relationship with the regulator is that we'll now be able to, uh, what we are now looking at is a structured uh, regulatory uh, framework uh, before the end of half one of this year where the CMA is still the overall regulator and we come in as a second regulator because we, we, we feel ourselves as the market, we, we may be in a better position to try and determine uh, both the eligibility and suitability of any new listings. And mainly uh, going towards this is the whole process, especially as we try to deepen uh, particularly our capital, our corporate bond uh, market and the government bond market, and see, especially for the corporate bond market, how that can be able to be used by the, by the SMEs. So um, it was easy to implement it. However, there are pains that uh, the companies have come back to us. They don't know exactly how to, uh, it's actually quite difficult to raise capital because the framework has been set up for large companies mm -hmm. and they're not able to uh, meet that. So that is a discussion we're going to be having. It's only too administratively to difficult or Sorry. too administratively difficult to do or just not the right questions or? Uh, yes, administratively difficult and also they don't meet the eligibility criteria uh, uh -huh. because the eligibility criteria for raising new capital was initially formulated uh, with the big companies uh, on the main investment market segment and the fixed income segment in, in mind. But we have not created anything similar for, this, uh, for the small companies. Though we have a stopgap measure that we are looking at currently, um, which is what we're calling a restricted trading board, where anybody with uh, an equivalent of slightly more, less than $50,000 can be able to invest directly in any uh, issue of security that has been issued without necessarily going through uh, quite the rigorous process of uh, disclosure that is required for other additional capital raises. Mm -hmm. um, Robert, can you talk a little bit about sort of, the, you know, Rwanda, you have the, the smallest uh, uh, stock market uh, in the region, but you know, if there's been any lesson that any of us have learned over the past decade is don't sell Rwanda short just because they start maybe a little bit late. Before you know it, they're going to be way ahead of everybody else. So how do you think about going forward uh, you're going to be a very much an SME-based exchange. You're, you've got sort of limited number of large companies. You'll try to attract Kenyan cross-listings, of course, and cross-listings. But how are you thinking about SMEs in particular uh, on the exchange and the services that they need um, and attracting them and marketing them, et cetera? Um, first of all, uh, being the newest in the market, um, I think the, this background is important that um, the main reason why um, Rwanda thought capital market was to access the economy to long-term capital. Um, and that capital could be within or external. And one of the shortest way to uh, approach this was to set up a capital market environment with a regulatory framework that would allow easy entry of capital into the economy. And of course, to attract capital, you have to be able to also allow it to easily live. So integration became part of our key strategy in terms of developing the capital market. Okay. So that um, the capital market in Rwanda could leap and join the rest in the region. And that is why even yesterday, you could see cross-listing the other important thing also uh, is that in, in uh, developing a market, um, we, we realize that 
we have to replicate what has been uh, done elsewhere. But at the same time, we have to be able to put a market environment where the users of the market are comfortable and um, moving forward and going down to the question of the um, SME, mm. um, we've seen that uh, it, was, it was an emerging trend. Most of the capital markets in East Africa were setting up alternative markets aimed at, uh, at uh, lower capitalized businesses, family businesses, or businesses that would not be able to meet all the listing requirements, especially disclosure requirements for the uh, main board listing. So what we did is we didn't give them names like alternative market and gems. We went straight to the point and we created an SME market for um, small and medium enterprises. And uh, what we did also is just like the rest of the markets, uh, we scaled down the disclosure requirements. Um, we brought down um, requirements, for example, for uh, the minimum amount of capital that in these enterprises would access. For instance, we don't have a minimum capital requirement for um, an SME because we felt that um, the basis for determining that minimum, I think, should be done by the market. Mm. Uh, because if you don't have a market already, you're a regulator, it'd be very difficult to come up with a number. So this was left, uh, left open, and the market will take care of that. Um, in terms of the minimum um, um, number of years in business, we also don't have that in our SME um, requirements. You can bring in a new business, but there's only a requirement that you require to have the business uh, underwritten by um, an investment uh, okay. house. Okay. So, so far, what we've done is um, we've, we've, we've gone door to door to um, businesses that uh, would con be considered SMEs. We've, uh, we have a specific target, and the response we've been getting has been um, very, very um, positive. But there's one thing for a business to want to come and access capital um, on the stock exchange or through the SME market. One thing, and the other one actually qualifying. Yeah. Uh, because of um, the challenges, especially the, uh, the structures of businesses. Yeah. So what we do, and that's what we've started doing, is we sit with these businesses, we identify what ch their challenges are today, and come up with a plan and give them direction and targets as to when they would be ready to access long-term capital. So that's real hand-holding. I mean, you really feel that you need to lead them through the process in a, in a very guided way. Yes, absolutely. Because um, whether it's an SME or, um, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a big a corporate, um, I mean, governance issues, there has to be a certain minimum um, level of governance uh, in terms of disclosure, in terms of the number of board members, and in terms of whether the board members are all one family or do you have external board ah, members. Right. So, and these are things that would help people who would be giving their capital yeah. to these businesses yeah. Yeah. to try and uh, be able to assess yeah. how, I mean, the viability. Yeah. So, Bharat and Alini, is there, a, is there a similar dynamic with small farmers and small agriculture that you have to kind of pay special attention to them? And how, if so, how does that work? And what, what, what was done? And maybe start with you, Alini. Well, I see that, you know, um, the, She's, uh, not mic'd. Can, you, can we mic uh, the middle chair? Hello, hello. Yeah. Okay. So I would say that, you know, the Ethiopia uh, experiment, if we want to call it that, uh, was really starting from the very idea that the exchange not only was going to do things differently on the spot evolving to futures uh, model, but also, and, and a number of other things we did differently, but also the, the very idea that the exchange was going to be built to serve the small actors whether they're small traders or small farmers. Uh, and so the design of the exchange uh, wasn't um, sort of like a, a, a market, as I call it sometimes, for the suits, you know, the, 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 the London Business School and uh, Harvard uh, Business School types sitting in offices, you know, trading at terminals, but rather from the very beginning, the idea was that we were building a market for the people that actually 
uh, currently trade in, in the Ethiopian uh, markets. And so, uh, so we built from the ground up, which meant that, uh, as Robert was saying, many of the things that without you know, compromising on standards of, of performance. For example, certification, uh, you know, for brokers, et cetera, uh, was, was absolutely upheld, but with the optic that we would modify the way that the training was delivered, the, even the fact that the certification exams were oriented to people that may not be literate. Oh, so we gave oral exams, we gave oral oh, exams in local language, but we gave the exams um, to the standard that any exchange should have. Yeah. Uh, similarly, contract size, uh, the lot size, we brought it down to the unit, uh, which is the, if you've seen all over rural Africa, the Isuzu or Isuzu truck that you know roams around the countryside collecting uh, grain and, and other products mm -hmm. from the from farm uh, from rural markets. That's a, a 50 bag uh, or 50 uh, 100 kg sack uh, capacity truck. So that became our 510 contract. Mm -hmm. And so the same way that Chicago's um, uh, lot size was really evolved from what a, 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 a rail car held in 1848, yeah. similarly the lot size on the Ethiopic Commodity Exchange uh, conforms to what the, the most common denominator of trade, you know, of transport around the countryside. So that idea that we built up from the base, I think, um, and modified uh, without compromising um, standards of excellence and performance, it's, uh, it's the only T plus one settlement system uh, exchange in Africa. Um, it's real time uh, market information with more than a million subscribers on SMS, mm -hmm. uh, more than uh, two million call-ins on a, on a toll-free uh, real-time database uh, service. So all of these things that we were doing, um, you know, instant feeds to even to actually Reuters mm -hmm. uh, and Bloomberg, so all of these things were still at, at, at what we consider global standard, but uh, localized, customized, and with extensive uh, public education. Okay. And for that reason, one of the other things we had to really make a decision about is to retain a floor. Okay. And we did that not because we didn't have the technology to have a uh, fully automated uh, trading system, but because it was important to open up the black box and to let people see what was inside uh -huh. uh, the trading system by actually having a trading floor, which is now you know, being um, evolved out. So I just got the uh, five minute uh, warning from the, the cops over there. So there's five of you on the panel. So that means you get one minute each to uh, give concluding remarks. And let me ask you as part of your concluding remarks to you know, feel free to comment on uh, if you have something that you'd like to say, but also try to paint for us your vision of the future, where you think we are going uh, in your sp specific areas. And uh, uh, I have to watch the, the, the clock. So, yeah. so Sparat, let's start yeah. with you. No, I think uh, I'll start where uh, uh, the Canadian left. Uh, how small and smallholders? Smallholders would be critical in this structure. If the commodity exchanges in Africa have to uh, succeed, it has to be smallholder oriented. Uh, ECX, uh, Dr. Eleni spoke about, I've built another exchange in Malawi, which is again a smallholder oriented and uh, is working very fine. Uh, the thing is, in Malawi, we did not have the government support to actually push everything through the exchange. It was not, it, we could not have the mandatory thing. So we had to get the buy-in of the buyers and the sellers more than a mandatory exchange would require. So what we did was we went down to the uh, cooperatives, reorganized them as aggregators. Huh. And that that's, was the major thing that's that actually added yeah. uh, uh, to the volumes of the exchange. So now aggregators, actually the uh, small farmers who bring in 10, 15, 20 bags, get organized into a small structure, they use their own facility for field warehousing, and now today, they're selling to buyers in uh, India and Dubai. Yeah, wow. Because now buyers in India and Dubai can straight away uh, buy from a group of smallholder farmers, and we did an analysis. Yep. The price analysis, if you take, if yep. you take from uh, Malawi. Lesson. lesson, bottom line lesson, lesson. Yeah, $70 price difference. That's okay. the uh, money that is shared between the buyers and the sellers. Okay, so, so key piece of advice. To key piece of advice, get the smallholder organized into uh, structures and uh, let the uh, markets be uh, run by the experts, that's the technocrats. Okay, Eleni, some Very future quickly. and a key piece of advice. Very quickly, um, I think that building an exchange and running an exchange should be like uh, being on a catamaran rather than, a f than on a freighter ship. Um, as you know, catamarans sail by uh, being very nimble and responsive to wind changes and making frequent tacks, zigzagging when it's not necessarily obvious how they're getting from A to B. Yeah. A freighter ship you know, sticks to a, a very single course like the Titanic and it's very difficult to change in any direction. So when you're building an exchange, you should be a catamaran 
because you've got to move with the, quickly, you've got to adapt, you've got to be responsive to the changing winds out there, and that's the only way to succeed. Okay. Um, maybe just to add what, to she, what she said, yes, uh, you basically have to adapt to yeah, the environment that you live in. For us, um, uh, the gem space is one of the areas that we'll be concentrating on. Uh, but in addition to that, um, the discussion yesterday about bringing the government bond market uh, closer to people by enabling them to use mobile phones, I think we just have to take advantage of those uh, kind, of, kind of things, and not only for the bond market, but also for the equities, and going forward for the corporate bond market. Uh, but what Barrett and Eleni have spoken about uh, in the commodity space, I think uh, the exchanges uh, uh, going live on, on our derivatives market uh, in half one this year, uh, at, we are at advanced stages, but I think it's our responsibility as our capital markets, as the exchange there to be able to see that indeed agriculture plays a very big role in our market and for us we need to be able to play in that space and I also don't think as happened in South Africa uh, where the markets were fragmented I think this is all something that can be done within one unit and we intend to be able to actively pursue the derivatives market both for financial and commodities exchanges uh, during the course of the year. Okay. Thank you. Donna? Okay, four points quickly. Uh, importance of the public markets. I think for investors, there's trust, there's the uh, transparency uh, and price discovery, uh, and that's very critical. For market makers, uh, the banks with, with Basel III coming in, capital, liquidity, the public markets, the exchanges are going to provide a benefit. We can't lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need them for liquidity, and that's going to be critical. Uh, and for issuers as well, the, the brand building, the migration from the small markets and the junior boards up to the main boards, very critical in terms of incubation mm -hmm. of small and medium-sized companies. So I think the public markets are critical in any capital market development. Uh, regulation sequencing, I think that we, sh we need to get the big things right first. Mm -hmm. Basic companies law, basic um, uh, financial markets law, the rules of enforcement, and the right of title. Mm -hmm. I think if you get those basic things right, that will certainly facilitate capital markets uh, development. Okay. Regional integration. At the moment, let's be honest, everybody wants independence. Everybody wants their own exchange. But we all know that the way these markets are, are moving now is that state-of-the-art technology is critical. Mm -hmm. We have probably all saw yesterday the Australian Stock Exchange announced that they're going to be spending $35 million to implement the Sonova system over the next two years. Can everybody sitting up here, ourselves included, can we afford to do that? Mm -hmm. Should we afford to do that? Should we not look at utilities? Okay. And the last point is the relevance to the real economy. Whether we're a small exchange just starting out, and we wish you all the best for, from Rwanda, Thank you. The, uh, we have to stay relevant to the local economy. Okay. And so, that's for Rwanda and South Africa and all of us. Okay, fantastic. Okay, Robert. Yeah, um, I think I'll pick up from uh, what she's concluded on. We have to, re to be relevant to the economy. We have to, uh, first and foremost, identify how we are going to use or which assets within our economies should we push mm -hmm. towards capital markets? Because yeah. um, this is, a, a, I think, my parting shot. We've, we have to uh, give the capital market development, especially in Africa, the relevance it requires. And the reason being this, one, the capital markets instills governance and, and uh, discipline in markets, and therefore, when we are privatizing our assets, we have to make sure that even if they are not ready today, they will still have to be privatized through the capital markets, even if it takes one decade, but they have to come through the market because that's the most transparent way. And when we do that, we actually uh, bring attention of international investors, people with the size of capital that we need to invest in our economies. Yeah. Well, I have a page of lessons that I learned from, from this panel, but let me just quickly reiterate some of the, the, the top ones that I've learned. Uh, so price discovery is fundamental, absolutely, and that is based on trust, and if you can't have trust, then you've got to make sure that your exchange provides that kind of uh, price discovery. Uh, the importance of exchanges for liquidity. So actually better and better to have on a consolidated exchange more asset classes and, and, and one way to trade because that's where you get uh, um, a market depth. So get the big things right. There's no point in buying a fancy lamp if you don't have a, a reasonable and, and steady supply of electricity. And in particular, that means getting the spot markets down before you, you know, kind of embark on, on, on futures. 
um, regulation, uh, be very wary of regulatory fragmentation. This is particularly important in commodities because you've got kind of financial regulators and agricultural regulators. You've got to make sure that they, that they coordinate together. Um, this regulatory framework should be very nimble and adaptable, and this, these are new markets, and so just make sure that you're not uh, too, too heavy-handed. Uh, very key to go after the small, uh, you know, Africa will be built on the small producers, both agriculture and business. They do need some kind of incubation. They need some hand-holding. But in addition, if you can, try to aggregate wherever you can to get, again, uh, economies of scale. Be very customer-focused. Even if you're a monopoly, you've got to act like a commercial commercial enterprise and, and be quite focused on your, your uh, customers. And last, you know, as Robert said, you know, understand where your competitive advantage is and exploit that for your, for your country and your public markets. Uh, so with that, I, I would like to thank my panelists for a very engaging discussion.